Number two, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only two Patreon supporters, only two Patreon supporters away from achieving our next major milestone for $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait. All Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll also gain access to membership-only content, our private Patreon members-only Facebook group, and so much more. Again, we are only two Patreon subscribers from hitting this next major milestone, and we will announce where and when our Patreon members only, Patreon members only, meetup will be. It's going to be a massive event with a ton of fishing guides, and it'll be completely free to all Patreon supporters. Link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. Today, we are heading back up to Pennsylvania to the Juniata River with uh, well, with the man, the myth, the legend. I don't even know what to call you in those glasses right now. Uh, Jake, how are you doing? Larry, how are you guys doing tonight? Great. I'm doing pretty good. Um, to really set the stage here, Larry just won the big event up on the Juniata River that was... This is a fun story here with this. It was scheduled to be the first event of the year back early in the spring, but because of the weather conditions not behaving, Jake, you had to call an audible and move it, correct? Yeah, um, the, we had epic floodwaters um, April 6th, and you know the whole area was just terrible with floodwaters. So um, we really wanted to kick it off up there because the Juniata in the early spring is, it's, I mean, just it's just stupid like you can go up there in the early spring and catch you know five 20 inch fish really easy um in in one day like it, it very well could have been 100 inches that won that tournament in april so um it's a major spawning hub with the susquehanna a lot of big fish migrate up there in the springtime so um but we had to we had to adjust adjust fire on that and uh you know come back to and the other thing too with uh, you know pennsylvania has a uh, closure during the bass spawn where they go april 5th the second weekend of april to the second weekend of june that are shut down and you can't have bass tournaments or fish for bass or target bass on beds i should say um so since they had that closure and we had the you know we had to push it back to june 22nd and Probably wasn't the best that the Juniata River could have fished with extremely low, clear water and terrible heat. Um, but Larry, uh, you know, Larry put the smack down on them. So some people figured out how to catch them. So does does the Juniata have any issues with with droughts this time of year it's funny to think that we yes. have flooding and then we have this massive heat wave all in the same year yes. like would you have potentially had to like move it again because i know the no. shenandoah and the potomac no you might be able to fish it so so the the great thing about the juniata is when it gets low 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 it basically makes it where most most jet boats can't run right most most people who have a jet boat are typically not going to go up and chance it on the Juniata in the summertime just because of the amount of grass and the amount of low water. Um, it makes it a very difficult fishery to fish. So it's actually a kayaker's paradise. Um, a kayaker can get on that river and float down it and drag around. And, you know, you might go, uh, you know, a stretch where you got ankle deep water for, you know, a half mile. Like it, it's just, you know, it's one of those types of places where it's it's actually set up best for kayak fishing. Um, so there was no chance that we were going to move it the second time around unless there was more high water. And and I just want to like I want to talk about the amount of water that we had for that first tournament on June twenty second. I think the gauge was like what three and a half feet at the Newport gauge, yeah. something like that. April sixth. It was like 
almost 20 feet at the Newport gauge. So imagine 17 feet of water more. Like that's how much water we had. That's, you know, it was, um, yeah. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, it's just interesting because, you know, as of recording this, NVKBA, we're trying to have our event on the Upper Potomac um, from the Great Falls to Harpers Ferry. And there's a massive drought. Uh, Shenandoah National Park, you're not allowed to fish certain streams and stuff because we haven't had any rain and it's just getting really bad here. But I guess also because of Raystown Reservoir, that does help where that thing's always pulling water, right? So No, not necessarily, no. Really? Um, I mean, it, it. there's always going to be water running out of it, sure, but... Um, you know, it, in the, in the low water conditions, they may not, they may only be running what they need to run, which might not be a lot based on what the streams that are feeding it are putting into it because Raystown is not, and I don't believe it's an electro power dam. It's, it's a recreational body of water more than it is for anything else. So they, they make sure that they keep that place full. That way, the people coming from New York and other places can get out there and run their big fancy motors on their beautiful big fancy boats. So, going into this event, then how how do you practice for something when it's super shallow? You're dealing with hot conditions. Fish are going to be very spooky. Larry, I mean, we could start with you. Like, what was your practice like leading up to this event? So, the week before I practice, a few ramps up. It was definitely shallow, but it was, it was good conditions. But that was really the start of our first heat wave. It was, yeah. The junior high tournament, I mean, it cranked the heat up that week greatly. And I figured that would uh, slow the bite. Because, you know, it's, it's summertime fishery, and typically, you know, you're, I'm going to hit it aggressively in the morning for the first hour. And then uh, and my assumption was right that the fish slowed down you know, in the afternoon, and then I just had to drop down to a little bit of a finesse swim bait. And, you know, that was you know, successful there. But, I mean, it, I just fished it, you know, like the main stem. You know, I mean, it just, I mean, both rivers fished to me the, the same. Um, but the water influx is what, what changes it. What does that do to the fish, in your opinion? Um, well, there's... On the, on the on the juniata, what I see is that it obviously pushes them to the banks on the higher water. Uh, a lot of the banks are, you know, they have a little bit more curvatures too, where you can, you know, can pinpoint them to the ambush spots. But the main stem, main stem is a little different. You have more straight straight river there. Hmm. Um, but uh, I went into it thinking that you know on that first event there that the fish will be shallow in the banks in the morning and that's what what was what where they helped me and that's where i did most of the damage was the first hour that is fascinating to me how every river river is different because like the upper potomac the shenandoah right now you know this is no spoiler but like i'm catching them in shade lines like it, when it's a yeah. hundred thousand degrees shade lines but i got to go up for the first time and uh jake i don't think I, we did this on a stream yet but with a friend of mine to the susquehanna Holy crap! It, you do. Fish you that came. Thing, right? You came to my hood, and you didn't <laughs> tell me that you were coming. I saw those photos, and I literally wanted to go out and find you on your boat and choke slam <laughs> you into the dirty Susquehanna River water. I'm like this worthless son. I was <laughs> mad at you. Um, but I think so. If I can piggyback on what Larry was saying about the, you know, about the river. <clears throat> that in June, you know, that first hour or two was really key. Crucial. It was absolutely key. And and that's honestly, that's one thing that absolutely destroyed my day. Um, one thing I'll say about the Juniata, the Juniata, when it's low and clear and those fish can see a long ways, they can see things a long, long ways. Um, if you're floating downriver and casting downriver at fish, the likelihood of you having a lot of success is probably not going to be good. Um, you really kind of have to attack those fish from a from a position that they're not looking at because if they see anything that's odd, anything that's uh, abnormal, 
they just won't eat. They're not stupid. Like they don't get big for, you know, for no reason. You'll catch the small ones. You'll catch all the small ones you want to catch. If you want to go to the Juniata river and catch 115 inch fish, you can absolutely do that all day. Float about 10 miles of it and you'll catch a hundred of them. But to catch those big ones, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be tactical in the way that you present yourself. Um, and that was one thing that absolutely ruined my morning. I launched at a place and there was a bunch of other people that launched there. And I had a very specific plan where I knew that there was some big fish at, and I was going to fish this hole. I was going to let people, you know, kind of go away and, and do their thing and start their floats. Um, and I was going to fish this one hole and I planned on sitting there all day. I was just going to camp because I knew what was there. Um, but first thing in the morning, people just kind of like, they, well, the one, they went, they went right through the hole. There was like four people that motored right mm -hmm. through the hole. And when I'm saying hole, I'm talking like six feet deep. If your motor's sticking two feet below the water, you have notified those fish. Yeah. Um, so they went right through the hole. I stayed there. I caught a couple, but then they were all like up above the hole and kind of like floating around and stuff. And I'm like, man, these fish are not going to eat. So I started going down river and, you know, but if the Juniata low and clear, you gotta, you gotta ambush these big fish. Like you cannot let them know that you're there. Cause if they, if they sense that you're there or see that you're there, they're not going to eat. Well, this time of year, when you're talking about big, small mouth, shallow, hot water, people, competitors, random tubers float over your hole. How long until it settles? You think? Are you talking like five to ten minutes? Or are you really camping in that area before those fish get relaxed and, and are ready to feed again? I think it depends on the hole. I think it depends on what the hole has. If the hole doesn't have a whole lot of cover or structure, I think you might have to wait a while. But if it has enough cover and structure that they kind of hunker down and just wait until things normalize, I think you can catch them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like if you get like a bank. Um, you know, a shoreline, you know, two foot hole and you get some people that float down past that and that smallmouth then vacates that area. I mean, you're waiting until probably a new one comes back. Yeah. Yeah. The Juniata can be challenging to fish right now, especially because you have all the pleasure, the kayakers, the <laughs> not fishermen, um, the Amish. Yeah, you probably know what I'm talking about with that. That's so random. Did not have that on my bingo card. I mean, it, that I spun myself out a few times that morning because because the Amish. Oh, they yeah, they'll. I had one one boat come down there, 12, 14 foot John boat, and I'm like, kidding you? They'll stack like four to six full size adults in that boat, and they'll stand shoulder to shoulder. And you know, yeah. I believe in stealth and being quiet and they come banging down off your ledges and they stop and, and they had me trapped into a ledge and I mean, and that scatters your fish. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of traffic on the Juniata this, this time, that time of year. I mean, then let, let's really get into the tournament day. Um, you, you talk about the morning bite being crucial, which gen generically speaking across the country this time of year it is. Yeah. Are you planning on making a long run or are you trying to get as close to your spot as possible to maximize the time you have that early morning bite? With with a kayak, I usually try to limit myself to four miles from where okay. I want. Um, you know, I have a little bit of a milk run design, but you know, that's that's about the furthest I want to run, so don't waste too much time. And I'm and with the kayak and I'm power fishing now. And you're working upriver or down? Upriver. Upriver. Okay. So I do single access. Smart. Smart. So, I mean, how did your day progress? When did you get your first keeper in the boat? Uh, within within minutes. Oh, well, that's, that's a yeah, good start. It was, it, was, it was the first fish, but you know, I was it, I just seen an ambush spot that I'd fished before, and um, the past two times I fished, there was always a, a always a a, a good sized bass sitting on that that area and i'm talking shallow like i call it fin shallow to the point that where you know the, the backer i'm sure jake's seen it before on a river is like the fin dorsal fins practically out of the water and I, and I that's it impressive there. it's it's crazy because you know years back i would think hey go for the deep water that's where they're at but they want that oxygenated low water 
I'm impressed at how shallow the green ones and the brown ones will get. I in another tournament I had this year, Sleeters like they were not in deep grass. They were in one inch of water. And if there was any type of shade, it doesn't look like there could be a fish there, but you get back up in there and they they're lodged in there. And it's insane how camouflage they can be in that stu- super, super clear yeah. stuff like that. So shade shade is an equalizer. Um, I don't care if there's a whole lot of current. I don't care if there's structure cover shade is an equalizer. If you get a spot that is going to be shaded all day long, there will be a fish there. Um, there's another equalizer that I'm not going to talk about because we have a very important tournament coming at the end of the month, but there is another equalizer that are on these rivers that it, it doesn't matter what's there. If this exists, there's going to be a, a big fish there, but shade <clears throat> shade is huge. And it's not so much like, you, you know, you don't think of shade being important because of the fact that like, it's cooler because for us it's cooler and sure maybe that water might be slightly cooler but that water is moving through there that water mm-hmm. was not shaded you know a half mile upstream it's not necessarily because the water is cooler it provides them an ambush location where they are where they're camouflaged and it provides them a spot where they are protected from the birds because the birds cannot see their black backs against black rocks in black shade and the birds here on the river are one of the largest predators of these smallmouth bass. Mm-hmm. So that is something that they the shade is an equalizer and they will, you will find them in it at all hours of the day. Sometimes incredibly shallow. You'll, you'll come floating down past the spot and think to yourself, there's zero chance that a smallmouth could be in there. But then one jets out and you're like, holy shit, that was a giant. And it's something that we can all pattern. I mean, you know, other equalizers that I've thought of is that I've had in the past, especially for like the Shenandoah is like springs, uh, you know, creeks that have cooler water, but that's, you got to fish that river so much to get that information. Shade lines is something anyone can target relatively easy and figure it out if mm-hmm. it's your first time. Um, but so many people just don't do that. But I mean, get, I'm getting Larry to get back to your day. Sure. So you crack a good one just to begin the day. Like, well, did you get all of your fish within like the first five minutes and you just crack a beer and be done? Or like, did you have to grind it out? Well, it, you know, we talk about the educated fish, you know, and, um, you know, it was shallow the first and the guys asked, what are you using? You know, I won't give away all the secret sauce, of course, but, you know, it's what a lot of river fish we use. It was a spinnerbait. You know, Shock. That, that first shallow bass and it was so shallow i kind of fouled the cast and it, it landed um a little bit behind where i wanted to and i remember reeling it in and seeing there wasn't enough water for the top blade to catch water and spin you know it was just plopping yeah. a little bit and next like jake said there next thing you know here comes this four foot long wake coming at that bait and you know i'm a pretty good fisherman not to overreact and pour you know like that so i just kept cranking it it whacked that thing and it came out of the air and i'm like oh great is this a 18 inch bass easy and next thing you know it comes unbuttoned Oof. and i'm like really it just Damn. so i was having to use at that point in time i was using a, the a painted blade and i just tied that thing on in the morning and I brought it back and you can see the teeth marks on the upper blade. So all he had to do was so shallow, what he did was grab the hole of that top blade and then spit it out. And I ran across that a couple other times this year too with the blades. And they were just hitting the top blade. And uh, but anyway, so I was a little frustrated, shook that off, went up probably another on the bank again, another probably 40 yards. And the sand found a rock, and I said, "Man, it looks so fishy. I'm going to throw it in there." I threw behind that rock three times, no bites. Threw the head of the rock twice, no bites. The next time I, I threw the last cast is the last time, and I said, "It's got to be a fish in there." I brought that spinner bait back like a jig and jigged it back, and it, hmm. it, it picked it up just like if you were jigging fishing, like a net rig. And that and that was like nineteen and a quarter, nineteen and a half, something like that. 
why is spinnerbait versus so many other bladed presentations this time of year? Because I would not have had some spinnerbait on my bingo card versus like an inline spinner, uh, you know, an underspin, something like that. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know, Thomas. I was I mean, I've gotten beat and crushed by other anglers using blades and I could never figure them out. The past couple, three years, I've been, you know, more power fishing in the morning. And I'm mm. like my bite in the morning. If I can if I know they're gonna hit a blade or something aggressive, I'll stay with it until it until it goes away. But Larry, was it a was it a double willow? It was. Yeah. But you know, I mean, there's a lot of guys throwing blades too, but you know, I just feel that right now what I'm using, I have a lot of confidence in it and that, that's really the keys. And, but then, you know, that worked, you know, I picked fish up there off the bank for a little bit. Um, and then about an hour and a half later, you know, the fish really moved to the center of, of the Juniata. And then, I, and then I lost them. I went from like 10, from 10 o'clock to probably noon without a fish. Damn. And that was when this, you know, and I, I, and, you know, eventually, oh, there was one, there was another spinnerbait fish that was very shallow. And sometimes, you know, you know, sometimes those fish are really spooky and you've got to throw that, spinnerbait on the bank mm -hmm. drag it in and i fouled that cast up too i threw it in there it was just on ambush foul i think i hit the head hit the fish on the head and it just went out or again like a you know 20 inch carp <laughs> not came back really, two hours later um and threw a uh, swim bait in there downside swim bait and I'm, and I'm confident i caught them and that was the kicker that really helped the end of the day so it makes sense yeah that makes <clears throat> sense this time of year if i could if i could hit on the whole spinnerbait aspect um specifically the the double willows um i like a double willow almost all the time i think if you need vibration you can get good vibration out of big double willows but the double willows they look like our bait fish they're the they're the same size as our bait fish right mm. um <clears throat> but the spinnerbait is so versatile. Sure. It's such a versatile bait in the, in the fact that like Larry was saying, he could work it back like a jig and not get, you know, not get hung up. He could work it back super like, well, I, I'll just run through it. You can work it back super fast and you can make those blades flutter across the top of yeah. the, to, uh, the top of the water. And you can work it back like a, a like a dang top water and they'll eat it that way. And if they start getting a little bit lower in the water column because of whatever conditions, then you can drop it down and you can, you know, you can pump it and burn it and it maintains it's, you know, where, where you need it to be. And then if you want to drag it back like a jig, you can do that too. And it stays complete, almost completely snagless or snag, yeah, it's snagless. I mean, it's, you know, you, you're not worried about the hook getting caught because there's a big wire in front of it. If you're bouncing off of rocks, you're bouncing off of wood. You can take the spinner bait and you can cast it deep into a lay down on the shoreline yeah. where those big fish are hiding in the shade. And you can put it in a place that most people can't put their chatterbait or their Ned rig. They for damn sure can't put their 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 top water treble hook bait baits or a crank bait so you're putting this bait in a position where other people aren't the spinner bait and this is why it's so popular it is so versatile in the ways that you can attack these fish on the river system that it just makes it in my opinion hands down the absolute best river fishing bait that you can use as a spinner bait are you compressing the frame in the shallower <laughs> water like this just to be able to keep it under the surface. Not no, I do. I'm, I'm not. I mean, they get all bent up. I only know the original shape. You know, at times. I mean, I. I don't. Know, I probably caught. Two hundred fifty fish since March, since April, when the water turned fifty degrees this year on spare bait. Mm. Easily. I got started that back into my rotation. But, I'm I, I'm very seasonal and situational with spinner baits but i guess because i'm such in a weird relationship with a swim jig and a crankbait honestly which is unhealthy but you know this, you only the, spinner get so many rods. Bait, the spinner bait never leaves my it never leaves my my tackle box um i'll use it in the winter time 
I'll use it in the summertime. I'll use it all the time. It, it, if I feel like I need to catch a fish, if I need just one fish, the spinner bait's the bait. Hmm. There's no other. There's no other bait that compares to the power of a spinner bait, in my opinion. So with that said, it sounds like you started off with a spinner bait, then Jake, on your, nope. your tournament day. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I I started off with a jackal pompadour, and in three casts, I had two fish. So good start. Yeah. And then after that, the guys were like, if I was here, there was one here, he like here, 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 here. They were all up in front of me. And I was like, this is pointless. I'm I'm not gonna sit here and frustrate myself. So then I went down river to another spot and that spot just didn't I had a lot of floaters, I had some jet boats coming through, like it was a mess. Yeah. And I actually about mid morning I went back to the launch and packed up and went to a different spot. So I cut out about an hour of my day. Was that su smart, successful, or it was fantastic because I got in the truck and put some air condition on. <laughs> so that's a no. Gotcha. <laughs> I mean, I was I was in I was comfortable. Stopped at a convenience store, got a nice cold drink. Nah, you don't need to do that, man. So yeah. Heat stroke doesn't last too long. So <laughs> Larry, how did you how did you refine the fish? What's that? How did you relocate the fish? You said about noon, you kind of lost them. What was that just mentally you were burnt out because it's 180 degrees or was it more like you just did legitimately lose the school? Well, I, I lost them. I, to the day, I still really don't know where they went. And I left fish to look for fish. And when I had that dry spell, I'm like, you know, I'm like, what is this? this is crazy. I, I said that I felt the pressure, you know, almost like MLF. I'm, you know, I just felt the pressure of time ticking. And I'm like, you know, look, you're catching fish are a lot. Now you, you got to get your shit together. So I just, I just went back to where I, I had some success. And they were done with the spinnerbait. And they were done with anything aggressive. So I just, you know, I... I Kept it in my mind the night before when I was, I said, look, if this, if this happens, don't spin out and, and just go downsize your, your swim bait. And that's what I did. I went down to a, a two and seven, five, uh, mm. just a little, let me try to get this on the camera here. Uh, right, so it, it, just put it right next to your nose. There you go. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and that did very well. It was just Z right man mushroom head. It was on like a Ned Heg with a with a sinker. Oh, okay. And, it, it, and I, I swam that, and that picked up a quite a bit of bites. And that was a uh, undercover baits, Susquehanna Susky Magic um, brand. Hmm. Oh, Randy. Yeah. So I mean that that thing worked really well. Um, but I think the pressure and the heat and everything else got to those fish and um they moved and that would be one of my weaknesses is try to relocate this fish whether it was a junior or other susky tournaments on fishing is it worth trying to refine the same group or just to move off and find a new group or is it think, it depends i think the judgment there is if if you have an idea if they're big fish you know are they dinks like I could see, like I knew that the giants were set up on ambush sites or, or anything like a, uh, a depth change. So, mm. but I, I, you know, but it is, it's a tough, especially when you're out a kayak, you know, you're not in a jet boat where you can run to yeah. different spots. That's why I just try to limit myself in a four mile area and you got to figure it out. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Whether it's a kayak or, or a boat, it's the idea of you can run too much. And even just because you have a motor, whether it's a 250 or a little torpedo, like you can't just spend your whole day running. And you got to be really crazy good at that place to know every spot. Um, uh, Chun, who fishes the Upper Potomac Shenandoah near us, like he will, he puts two batteries on the thing and he burns, but he has known that river so long, he will make one or two casts and move. And 
I think a lot of people fall into that trap that they think they can fish like that. But if you don't have the spots kind of mapped out meticulously, like you're just, your, your timing could be completely messed up. So I, I definitely feel that. Right. So when did you think that you had it? Um, I wasn't really sure, Thomas. I, I didn't, normally I'm looking at the app, you know, looking to see what our anglers are catching. And I just went in the mindset that, you know, 95 inches had, if you didn't have 95 inches, you weren't winning. So I just kept fishing. And, uh, I don't know. I think I only checked on the standings maybe twice. I, I just, cause I, I didn't think that I, I didn't think a 90 inches would do it. So I had my mindset was just 95 inches. And, yeah, uh, I, I, I personally think the only reason 90 had a chance was because of the heat. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and I really didn't, you know, a different time of year. I know in the spring is you better be packing 95, 98 inches at that river. But it's, I really, I really wasn't positive that I, that I did that great. And then when I caught that last fish, you know, close to lines out, I went to, you know, I went to take the picture, and my camera said overheated. My phone. <laughs> That's it. Totally. Then the sweat was pouring off me. Now I was like. And then on the cell service, it's not that great. So I went back to the ramp and I finally got submitted. And then when I looked at the standings, it said the standings were shut down or closed. So just walking up to the truck, guy was like, you know, how'd you do it? And I'm like, I don't know. I said, I think I got, I think I got 90 inches. And someone said, well, if you got 90 inches, you probably won. And that's, then that's when it sunk in. And so I was like, for people that aren't familiar with, 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 with your rivers up there, would 90 get you top 10? Were you comfortable with that? Or was that really low weight or low weight? Sorry about that. Uh, we're really low inches for this time of year. No, I think if you're, if you're at that 90 inches, you're probably in the top 10. Jake. It, I, I think, I think it's a, that's a dependent question because if we would have had a week of 80 degree days, I think 90 in the Juniata probably would have gotten you a top 10. I don't think it would have gotten you a top 10 in the Susquehanna if we had a week of cool, uh, cool weather. Um, you know, you know, it, it's the, the Juniata in the summertime is it fishes different than the Susquehanna. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of fish, but because of, because of the fact that it's a spawning hub, um, it's, there's typically, a lot of 15, 16, you know, 16 and under inch fish that live in that river system. And you literally have to weed through a bunch of those to get to the bigger ones. Um, and the bigger ones are giants. They're giants. I mean, they, those fish are, they, they're resident fish. They live there all year. Like they're big. Um, but the Susquehanna just tends to have a lot more of that 18 to 20 inch class fish that are in more abundance. So I, I, I have a hard time thinking that 90 inches gets you a top 10 in the Susquehanna. But again, that heat, that heat was a huge factor right now. 90 inches would probably get you a top 10 in the Susquehanna. But I think if you look a couple years back, you know, at tournaments, um, you know, you look at the Bassmaster last year in October. I don't think 90 inches would have gotten you a top 10. I think it was out of the top 10. Um, at the year prior to that, around the same time that we're having the tournament this year, at the end of July, um, you know, you were 95, 96 inches each day is what the the top three had. Um and that was at the end of July. So maybe 90 inches each day would have gotten you a top 10, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hit or miss. I, I think it's a weather dependent question. Yeah. So with that said, I mean, you, you absolutely just get this massive W right now. And then you're basically going down a little bit more into the main tribute, the main, the main deal, which is the Susquehanna. What is everyone's expectations for that event? As we've talked about with the heat, uh, it was 105 today where I'm at, at Williamsport, Maryland. Do you think it's going to be a little bit more stingy on the Susky? Do you think it's we still got some time for some rain to come in and change things? I wish. I hope. I, I would love to see a river that's about five to six feet instead of three. 
Um, I think the river is going to fish pretty tough when you have a week of practice pre-fishing that's occurring from all the people coming in from the Bassmaster that's getting those fish incredibly spooky. And then on top of that, I mean, naturally, the main stem from Sunbury to Duncannon is probably going to get the most pressure, and that's likely where the fish are, you know, the winning bags are going to come from um, because the West Branch fish get incredibly hard to catch in the low, clear water when it's hot, and the North Branch fish, I just feel like, doesn't hold as the same quality, quantity. Um so I think that you could reasonably expect 90 to 93 inches each day to win the Susquehanna Damn. at the end of July. Yeah. I mean, the shallow water will help for someone that the fish are all pulled up into and finds that hole for a lot of the other anglers. It's going to be challenging. Yeah. And the, pers the person that finds that hole is also going to have to worry about floaters and Mm -hmm. to other people you know so you know you're you're looking at 150 to 200 people being on this river on saturday and sunday and then you know a safe bet to say that 75 of them are going to fish wednesday through friday and probably 50 to 30 of them are going to fish saturday through wednesday and then you know continue fishing the rest of the practice week. So they're going to see a lot of things. Um, yeah. I, and ooh. in the above Williamsport, you have the other scenarios that are allowed to fish uh, tournaments, you know, bag, bring them back, um, yeah. which I used to be part of. And I, I still support that, but um, there's a charity event um, this weekend up there for that tournament. And then, um, I think it's Sunday second day to bass masters they have a tournament up there as well so you got to realize all the pressure from what from above sunbury and you got those fish being caught and drugged back to weigh in so yeah. there's, there's it's stuff i think it's going to be a little bit challenging this year with the low water and the pressure like jake said when it comes to your event and then we'll also bring into bass master how far up tributaries are you allowed to go do they have cutoffs with that stuff so it's one mile up any tributary um, hmm. that you're allowed to launch up. I believe you can go up the tributary as far as you'd like, but you have to return back to that one mile within. Um, the Juniata is different. They did open the Juniata all the way up to Thompson Town Ramp. Um, so you are allowed to fish the Juniata as a part of the Bassmaster and MAKBF tournaments, uh, the 27th and 28th. Um, but they go a long ways up the West Branch and they go a long ways up the North Branch. Um, and then they cut it off in Duncannon where you can you can launch in Duncannon and go south. But. Yeah. It's skinny. Uh, it's skinny and it's sketchy, too. So um, there's some, you know, I wouldn't recommend that for the for a weak paddler who's relying on a motor. You mentioned uh, with, with, with live well tournaments that there will be a bunch of retread stationed. And we see in like lake tournaments like Kerr Reservoir, Nutbush, Gunnersville has these places, Murray, every place does, Woman Creek, for God's sakes, 10,000 pounds get stumped there. Will those retreads actually play in the tournament for somebody that's patient enough to actually work that area? It's tough because those fish get brought back to the pool where the way is. And I think that you got to give those time to the, for those fish to migrate back up to the areas they were originally caught. And when you're when you're those pools in Sunbury and so forth, and this weekend you've got jet skiers and pleasure boaters, and I, I just don't see that a winning scenario. Yeah, I mean, could it be done? Sure. Could the retreads play a factor? Sure. If somebody you know launched in Sunbury on Sunday and. You know, maybe they had a, a big tournament that came back there that day, there that Saturday and dropped off a bunch of fish. They could maybe do it. I I don't I don't personally think that those fish can contend with what's in the lower section of the of the boundaries. Um, I don't think that there's enough of those big fish up there to contend with what's in the lower section. Now, that being said, you might not need 
you might not need five 19 inch fish um, to win this tournament. So I could be wildly wrong on that too. Um, I don't know. You guys mentioned that this place is going to get pounded like a $20 hooker um, leading up to the event. With that said, and this being in your backyard, how much do you practice versus what I like to do on lake events is spectate. Uh, I picked Sleater's Lake for the Battle of Five Lakes. So I went out the weekend before, which was Father's Day, to just no rods and just to see where people were and how people were fishing it. So I got a vibe for what places were getting pressured. But I didn't want to fish it too much because it's first I want to address the fact that it, it's going to get beat like a twenty dollar hooker that has all of her teeth. <laughs> so um, it's going to get beat up pretty bad. However, um, in terms of like us, this being home water for Larry and I, um, I personally will go and probably just fish where I'm not going to fish and just try to sore lip as many as I possibly can. Okay. I call it defense. Yeah, don't sugarcoat it. I, I, you want me to lie to you? I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to lie to you. I I know I kind of know where I'm going to where I'm where I want to fish and I might go check that on like Sunday and Monday um before the bulk of the people get in and then if any time that I have off from Tuesday through Friday, I'm literally just trying to beat up other people's fish. You know, and I understand that, but I, I, in college, we went up to Lake Chautauqua and we had an event and we said like, okay, our plan is going to be up North. We know that let's just go mess around down South. Cause everyone's going to go down there. And in practice, we smoked them and we're like, oh shit, let's just completely bail on what we were originally going to do. And we stuck into the tournament and like, aren't you afraid you go there to, to mess with them and you catch 106 inches, no. you are going to be like, you know what? It's okay. I'm going to leave that. No, because every every launch in this river has winning fish in it. Mm. From Sunbury, from Sun, Sunbury to Duncannon, every single launch has winning fish. Yeah. It's it's this river system is built different. Like you go to some lakes, and you know maybe the north end of the lake will be turned on because it has grass, or the south end of the lake will be turned on because it has current, or whatever the case may be. From the top boundary to the bottom boundary, every every launch has winning fish on it. Well, if that's the case, why practice at all? Yeah. Beat up other people's fish? Don't you like catching fish? I mean, that's a fair point. I think there's I think there's something there's another joy and pleasure you get out of it, but we'll we'll say that for another <laughs> No, I mean, I'm not you know, I'm not trying to sound rude mm -hmm. when I when I say that, but <laughs> But there is there is certainly a tactic to it. If if you if you know that there's some out of towners that are coming here and they might have one or two spots, right? And they don't have the ability to know every section of, the, of this river, every launch from this river, and they may have gone and and caught them really good out of Mahatango, right? But I show up in Mahatango on Friday. And I literally just try to catch as many as I possibly can and, you know, just not really give a shit. There's, there's a tactic to that. And I don't that care work. that these, yeah, it works. Sure. Have you ever gone to a fishing spot, right? And you caught them really good one day and you've gone back the next and they've been, where'd they go? Yeah, that's pretty much my life story. <laughs> I mean, I uh, usually, I rarely, yeah. I rarely have a, a good practice or I don't worry about it. Sounds like I, you're I going to wherever uh, Jake was. <laughs> Jake probably, yeah, I was fishing behind Jake. But uh, no, I, just, it's like the whole saying the river, you know, you never fish the same river twice, you know, two days in a row. I mean, facts. I don't know what it is about the Susky. I, I don't know if the, the food moves them. You know, maybe they're stuck in a, in a certain area just feeding on crawfish, crayfish, and then they eat that area and they move a hundred yards over. I haven't figured that part out yet because, you know, there's days I struggle. I was out this past what, Sunday and I struggled on the main stem. And I was like, well, this is crazy. Cause you know, I've done very well on the main stem this year too. But you know, it, that water dropped again and it's definitely more and more heat. Mm -hmm. but, but again, where you found fish, like Jake said, was, you know, that shade line. But I went out 
fishing and said, I'm going to throw everything I don't usually throw, like whopper ploppers that, you know, and, you know, I caught five or six on that. Me and Billy Dorboro went out Saturday. We fished a, a lower section that not, neither of us are super familiar with. We went um, basically like Bainbridge down to Marietta type of area. Um, and the first two hours in the morning, like we were fishing the center grass islands, you know, just get catching a lot of fish, not a lot of big ones. Cause that, I don't know, like that stretch for me has never really produced a lot of big fish, yeah. but um, you know, we, we caught a lot of fish and then as soon as that sun came up, it was all about the shade, mm -hmm. it was all about the shade. And then I, I actually ended, I ended up the day with my biggest fish, like, at the very last fish that I caught out of a shade line. So to wrap up, what do you, what do you guess the winning inches will be for your next upcoming event? And then for the Bass Masters. So I'll let you go first, Larry. Well, I haven't confirmed yet that I'm fishing the Bass Masters. Um, so I'm sitting on the fence with that, but I'm, or I may just fish a single day of the MAKBF tournament. Um, but to answer your question, I still think somebody's going to get into it. And I think that they're going to have to catch 96, seven inches a day to be in the top, to be probably a top three with the Bass Masters. Now, th this weekend, I'm, I'm going back to the Juniata. There's another tournament there. You know, and I'm thinking if you have, again, 90 inches, maybe 92 inches will win that one because that's even shallower and grassy. Mm. I, so I'm of the opinion that I think in a 91 to 93 inches a day um, will be what it would take to win the Bassmaster. But the Bassmaster is a two day cumulative tournament. MAK, MAKBF, is two single day tournaments so that makes it incredibly different somebody could easily go out and bust 95 96 a day and win but you know the makbf but i i just don't see i don't see 95 or 96 a day repeatable for the same person what do you think will cash a check for the bassmaster then like cash in a check seven a day I, I, I think 85 a day will would catch would well maybe 80 yeah probably mid to low 80s a day consistent would cash a check but it also that depends too on how many people like if it's 200 people and they pay out you know 20 or 25 spots like I don't know what their ratio is but um that could that number could go up or down so yeah. you think like what do you think boat boat wise kayak wise that's gonna actually pull you think it could pull over 100 150 200. Uh, it, I, th I 100 percent think it'll pull close to 200. Right. The past two or three years that we've had a national level tournament here, it's it's been close to 200. Even some of the 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 newer, less popular tournaments have pulled in 150. So right. it, it's it's going to be a significant amount of kayakers on this river. Yeah, and that ramp pressure is going to be the one. I mean, you're you're launching. There's 18 guys next to you. It's going to be a challenge. You got six or seven, you might go home run. Hmm. That is interesting. Yeah. It's interesting how that has become the kayak destination when I know that like the guys for so many years tried to push tournaments out and then it became the kayak mecca. So it's kind of interesting how karma and all that stuff works out the way it does with the Susky and the Pennsylvania Department of Wildlife Resources, which if you guys could return my call, that would be amazing. By the way, because I'd like to, I'd like to get you guys on the show to talk about some things. Um, Jake, as always, do your plug. Uh, Mid Atlantic right. Association. I guess you're more than halfway through the year. Yeah, we are. We are absolutely. We have um, we have three events left, and and then then our TOC. Um, the the two events is coming up at the end of the month. We have the Susquehanna on July 27th and 28th, two single day tournaments. We have a member appreciation and DPS celebration event in August. Um, I, sp I guess we have more events than that. We, we also have a, um, a, a hosting event where we're hosting the native kayaks, uh, tournaments again, the, this, the 
MLF format where they come, they're coming in the fall. Hmm. And then we have our tournament of champions, which will be a two day culmination of, you know, of the best anglers of the year, people who have won or been in the top angler of the year. And that's what's inevitably going to decide our angler of the year. So, um, but with that being said, um, you know, for this particular event um, in the Juniata, we want to in send out an incredible amount of thanks to the Juniata River Valley Vis uh, Visitors Bureau. That Visitors Bureau was an absolute pleasure to work with in terms of scheduling and getting, you know, the necessary things that we needed to get done, even with the reschedule. Um, the JRV was fantastic. and the amount of things that they have in that valley in that river valley you know if you're looking to get away from the city and you're looking to get away from the hustle and bustle the campgrounds the hotels the wineries the you know the amount of amenities that are packed into that river valley in one of the most beautiful places on earth in my opinion the juniata river is the sight lines are incredible um and it's a clean river too. Like it's not a dirty river, like most of our, it's a pretty clean river. So, um, you know, the amount of opportunities that they have for you to get out and do fun stuff is incredible. And we would encourage anybody listening to contact the JRV and go to their website and see what they have to offer. Um, they were the presenting sponsor for this event. Um, we also had, you know, our series sponsor, Delaware Paddle Sports. It's, you know, the largest paddle sports retailer in the East coast. They deliver a kayak to anywhere you want to go to. They were a huge sponsor of our series. Um, and you know, that were huge. Thank you to them. Um, our, you know, individual kind of smaller sponsors for that event were suspends. They, they gave away, um, a, a very nice kayak cart and a set of kayak stands. And then there was, you know, the, the fishing online and tactical fishing company and so on, like the, the smaller sponsors that, you know, grab bag giveaway stuff. Um, tactical fishing company actually gave us uh, bait crates to give out to the winners. I think Larry got one of those bait crates. Um, he's a sponsor this year. He sponsored one of our events this year. He's actually a pretty big sponsor. So, and a shameless plug, I have this ready for the next podcast that I'm getting ready to do, but he recently came out with a new top water bait. Get a little, look on that that's a oh wait little duck um i i got a in my bait I got a yeah frog. that's the b that's the b2 popping frog that i've been doing really well on um yeah. i would take that with you when you go out on the river well yeah i, I threw it i threw it sunday and yeah uh, there was three or four but this is gonna be uh you know really crazy bait and it's so small it's two inches and it goes far so you know, hats off to our sponsors and everybody contributing because they, they put a lot of nice baits out for one one yeah. thing that you know with his with his top water baits and his frogs most top water baits that you get are not good for smallmouth because they don't compress good enough they don't have you know they don't have uh just the like this thing is just super pliable you have and to like boil them i remember doing yeah. it for a lot of old frogs I you don't have to do that with this let me see i can't really get it to Oh, wait, here we go. Yeah. I mean, it's it's got a, a forget it. Never mind. Um, it's a great bait. And this the new duck, it actually walks on a steady retrieve. Neat. Um, so anyway, but either way, um, thank you to those sponsors. And you know, coming up for the Susquehanna event, we've had our 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 presenting sponsor is Innovative Sportsman. Um, he's, you know, obviously has the best river kayak ever made. So he's going to be our presenting sponsor for the best river tournament that we have all year long. So, um, looking forward to that and, you know, thank you again to you for interviewing every single one of our winners this year. You take time out of your incredibly busy schedule, especially with ICAST happening. It's a nightmare. I mean, <laughs> it's gotta be a nightmare for you. I, I mean, so, but yeah, we appreciate you too getting us on here and, and to talk about and to highlight Larry's day because it's, you know, it's a big deal whenever you're going out there and winning, a, you know, a couple thousand dollars because you might have won big fish and, you know, and the tournament. Like there's, there's a lot of money getting thrown around in these little local series events. So oh, it is. And I, cause I, I've said this before on, 
I think it was last night with SB fishing. It's like, everything's gonna get regionalized. Cause why would you, if you, why would you drive to Lake Fork for an event when you can win the same amount of money 10 minutes from your house? Like it, it, it doesn't make sense anymore to make those long. I mean, unless you just want the glory of it all, like it, it's not really worth it. Cat events. If you're a boat guy, you can win just as much money with a cat event as you could driving down for some of these yeah. other events. So I don't know, but for sure. As always, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps out in the algorithm. Link in the episode description everything that we talked about. If you would like to go check out uh, Mid-Atlantic Kayak Association, all that stuff will be in the episode description. And we will see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.